the topic of this evening's talk of mine is Islam's view on terrorism and jihad. Islam is derived from the Arabic word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Almighty God is called as a Muslim. Today, the most important weapon in the world is the media. The media can convert black into white, day into night, hero into a villain, villain into a hero. And we find today in the international media, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. We find in the international media, the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the international satellite channels, on the internet, they are bombarding misconceptions about Islam. And according to an article that came in the Newsweek magazine on 16th of April 1979, it said that more than 60,000 books have been written against Islam in a span of 150 years. If you calculate, it is more than one book every day. And after 9-11, this has reached epidemic levels. And we find regularly in the media that Muslims are labeled as fundamentalists, as extremists, as terrorists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? A fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a person wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. We cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, if you have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he is bad for society. He's not a good fundamentalist. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist doctor whose profession is to save thousands of human lives, he's good for the society. You can't paint all fundamentals in the same brush. You have to first analyze in which field is the person a fundamentalist. As far as I am concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim, and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know, I follow, and I strive to practice the fundamental of Islam, and I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be certain teachings of Islam which some human being may not know the background, but the moment you give the reply with reason, logic, and why these teachings are there, there is not a single unbiased human being in the world who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. When we read the Webster's Dictionary, we come to know that fundamentalism was a word coined first time to describe the Christians of America in the early part of the 20th century. They were called as Protestant Christians because they protested against the church. The church believed that the message of the Bible was from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested and said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. 
if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is from God, this movement is a good movement. But on the other hand, if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not from God, then this movement of fundamentalism is not good. According to Oxford Dictionary, fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teachings and scriptures of any religion. But when we read the revised edition of the Oxford Dictionary, there's a slight change. The revised edition of Oxford Dictionary says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teachings and scriptures of any religion, especially Islam. Especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of the Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, you start thinking of a Muslim. Muslims are fundamentalists, Muslims are extremists, and many a times we Muslims go on the defense. As to Dr. Mahathir Muhammad rightly said, that why should we be apologetic? Many of us Muslims go on the defense, no, 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 I am not a fundamentalist, I am not an extremist. I tell the world that I am an extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely loving, I'm extremely just, I'm extremely honest. What's wrong in being extremely kind, extremely just, extremely honest? Can any human being tell me that being extremely kind is wrong, being extremely honest is wrong, being extremely just is wrong? If it benefits you, you're just. If it does not benefit you, you're not just. That's not Islam. And Quran says you have to be extremely kind, extremely loving, extremely compassionate, extremely honest. If you are a practicing Muslim, you have to be extremely kind, extremely honest, extremely just. You have to be extremist in the correct direction. Today the media labels, the media says that Muslims are terrorists. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? A terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror. When a robber sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the robber, the policeman is a terrorist. And many times we see that for the same person, for the same activity, two different labels are given. And the best example is when India was ruled by the British government about more than 60 years ago, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These people, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But we common Indians, we call these people as patriots, as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, you would call these people as patriots, as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. And many a times, when I'm addressing the Indian press, and they ask me the question, that why are Muslims terrorists? So I ask them a question, that more than 65 years ago, the Britishers called Bhagat Singh as a terrorist. Do you believe? And the press says, no. I say, why? No, because we know that Bhagat Singh was not a terrorist, he was a patriot. I said, even I do not agree that Bhagat Singh was a terrorist. He was a patriot. 60 years back when the Britishers labeled Bhagat Singh as a terrorist, you don't agree with him. Now when the Britishers are labeling Muslims as terrorists, why do you agree with them? Why these double standards? And we have this example in history in several places in the world. We know that a couple of centuries back, Britishers used to rule America. In 1776 was the American Revolution. At that time, there were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom of the country. And at that time, the British government called George Washington as terrorist number one. Terrorist number one in 1776 according to the British government, was George Washington. When USA gets its freedom, 
terrorist number one becomes the president of USA. We have example of South Africa. Previously, when the white apartheid government ruled South Africa, they arrested Nelson Mandela and imprisoned him in Robben Islands for more than 25 years. And they called him the terrorist number one. When South Africa got its freedom, the same terrorist number one becomes the president of New South Africa. And later on, he gets the Nobel Prize for peace. Not that he was bad and he became good. For the same activity for which he was called terrorist number one, later on, he gets the Nobel Prize for peace. Can you imagine terrorist number one in the world getting Nobel Prize for peace? So what we realize that whoever is in power, whatever label is given, it gets stuck, whether right or wrong. So today media is very powerful. Whatever label the media gives, unfortunately, it gets stuck, irrespective of whether it's right or wrong. That's why I said, today, media is the most powerful weapon in the world. It can convert black into white, day into night, hero into a villain, villain into a hero. And unfortunately, we Muslims, we are very backward as far as media is concerned. Today, the most misunderstood word in Islam is the word jihad. It is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslims, it's even misunderstood by the Muslims. Most of the non-Muslims, as well as Muslims, think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for fame, whether it be for name, whether it be for region, whether it be for wealth, whether it be for power, is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim, whether it be for name, for fame, for wealth, for power, for region. Jihad is an Arabic word which is derived from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. If a student is striving and struggling to pass in the examination, in Arabic we say, he is doing jihad. And many people think that jihad can only be done by Muslims. There are verses in the Quran which say that even non-Muslims did jihad. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travel upon travel did the mother bore them, and in pain did she give them birth. Immediately next verse, Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 15 says, But if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else of whom you have got no knowledge, don't obey them, but live with them with love and compassion. Here Quran is saying that non-Muslim parents who strive and struggle to make their children worship somebody else besides Almighty God, that is do shirk. Do not obey them, but yet live with them with love and compassion. The same message is repeated in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8. We have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. But if your parents strive and struggle, do jihad, to make you worship somebody else besides Allah, do not obey them. But yet, live with them with love and compassion. Here Quran is saying that the non-Muslim parents are doing jihad, they are striving and struggling to make the children do shirk, associate partners with God. This jihad is called as jihad fi sabil shaitan. What a Muslim should do is jihad fi sabil Allah. 
Normally when you use the word jihad is taken for granted, it is jihad fi sabilillah, jihad in the way of Allah, unless otherwise. Most of the Orientalists, they translate the word jihad as holy war. And unfortunately, many of the so-called Muslim scholars, inverted commas, even they translate jihad as holy war. Holy war, if you translate into Arabic, is harbum muqaddasa. If you read the Quran, nowhere in the Quran is the word harbum muqaddasa mentioned. And there is no hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where the word harbum muqaddasa is mentioned. This word holy war was first coined to describe the crusades done by the Christians. If you read history, several centuries ago, the Christian crusaders, they forced and killed tens of thousands of human beings in the name of Christianity. If you read history, the maximum number of human beings killed in the name of any religion, it is Christianity. And this they called it as the holy war. And today, they use it for the Arabic word jihad. Fundamentalist was first coined to describe the Christians. Today it is used for the Muslims. So jihad does not mean holy war. Jihad means to strive, to struggle. The best way to understand the meaning of jihad is to understand what the scriptures of Islam have to speak about jihad. What is mentioned in the Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we read the Quran, we come to know it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 78. Strive and struggle in Allah's cause as you ought to strive and struggle. Do jihad in Allah's way as you ought to do jihad with sincerity and discipline. For Allah has chosen for you and has not put any difficulties in your religion. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 20, As for the believers who suffer exile and strive with might and main in Allah's cause with their goods and their lives, these are the ones who shall attain the highest rank in the sight of Allah. And they shall go to paradise. They shall achieve Jannah. They shall achieve salvation. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's a hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, in the book of Jihad, hadith number 46. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said that Allah Messenger said that the person who does Jihad in Allah's way and Allah knows best who is doing jihad, who is striving and struggling in Allah's way. The person who strives and struggles in Allah's way and Allah knows best who is striving and struggling in His way is like a person who continuously fasts and prays. And Allah has promised him paradise if he is killed in the battlefield or Allah returns him safely with rewards and war booty. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 6, that as to those who strive in Allah's way, they do it for their own souls. For Allah is free of wants. He is not in need of his creatures. So if you strive and struggle in Allah's way, it is for your own benefit. It is not for Allah. Allah does not require the help of any of his creatures. He is free of all wants, worthy of all praises. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, hadith number 2784. Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad She asks the Prophet, can we join jihad? And the Prophet replies, perfect hajj is the best jihad for you. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Hadith number 5972, a man asked the Prophet that can he go for jihad? The Prophet asks him that do you have parents? He says yes. For you, serving your parents is jihad. It's mentioned in Sunan Nisai, hadith number 4209, a man asked the Prophet 
which is the best of jihad? And the Prophet replies, the best jihad is a person who speaks a word of truth against the tyrant ruler. It's mentioned in Sahih ibn Hibban, hadith number 4682, that the Prophet said, a mujahid is a person who strives and struggles against his own nafs, his own desire for the cause of Allah. And muhajir is a person who migrates from falsehood to the truth. From all these hadith we come to know that the best jihad keeps on changing depending upon the situation. When the Prophet told the man that do you have parents, the best jihad is to serve your parents. The Prophet knew that his parents required him. It does not mean always serving your parents is the best of jihad. For that particular person, because his parents required him, for him, the best jihad was serving his parents. So depending upon the situation, the best jihad changes. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 51, if it was our will, we would have sent a warner in every center of population. Next verse, Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 52 says, that's why, do not listen to the unbelievers, but strive against them strenuously with the Quran. Your Quran is talking about jihad bil Quran. Strive and struggle against the unbelievers with the Quran. Quran is talking about doing jihad with the Quran. That means you have to convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the non-Muslim. And today I think the best jihad according to me today is jihad bil Quran. Strive and struggle against the unbelievers by spreading the message of the Quran. <laughs> Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse 110, Kuntum khaira ummatan ukhridat nas O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people reward for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor. Allah, Almighty God, is calling us Muslims as the khaira umma, the best of people. Whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. In the same way, the principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. A teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is giving an honor to the Muslim and saying, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The reply is given in the same verse. Ta'mruna bil ma'roofi wa ta'launa in munkar. Wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. Allah is calling us the khaira ummah, the best of people, because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoin what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, then we aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. It is first on every Muslim that he conveys the message of Islam to those who are not aware. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, Kul in kana abaukum. Say whether it be for fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, your wives, the husbands, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives. Allah is saying in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 24, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, husbands, or wives, your relatives? And Allah continues, What tijaratun takshawna kasadaha, wa masakinu tarzawnaha. The wealth that you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the houses in which you live. Allah is asking you, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your brothers? Are they your spouses, wives and husbands? Are they your relatives? Is it the wealth you have amassed? The business in which you deal, the houses in which you live, and Allah continues, Ahabba ilaykum, min Allahi, wa rasulihi, wa jihadin fi sabili. 
And if you love all these eight things more than Allah, more than His Rasul, His Messenger, and more than doing jihad, striving and struggling in His way, Allah says, Fatarabbasu, wait. Hatta yati Allahu miamri. Wait until Allah brings His decision to you. Wallahu la hadrukum al fasikin. And Allah guides not the fasik people. Allah is saying in the Quran that if you love all these eight things, your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives and husbands, your relatives, the wealth they have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live, if you love all these things more than Allah, His Messenger, and striving and struggling in Allah's way, Allah says, wait until Allah brings His destruction into you. Wallahu la hadrukum al fasikin. And Allah guides not the fasik people. Today it is the duty of every Muslim that they should convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims who are not aware of it. Allah says in Surah Muhammad chapter number 47, verse number 38, Allah says, that if you do not do your job, Allah will substitute in your place another people, summa lakinam salakum, and they will not be like you. If you do not do your job, if you turn away from the path, Allah will substitute in your place another people. And they will not be like you. It is the duty of every Muslim that he should convey the message of Islam to the others who are not aware of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 208. Ya ayyuhal lazina amunu, O you believe, utkhru fi silmi ka'affa, enter into Islam wholeheartedly, and follow not the khutuat of shaitan, and follow not the footsteps of the devil. Allah is telling that, O you who believe, enter into Islam wholeheartedly, not partly, completely, and follow not the footsteps of the devil, for he to you, is an avowed enemy and when you read the Quran we come to know that mostly Allah says do not follow the footsteps of the devil you will not find Allah saying do not follow the devil you know why I like to give an example suppose there is a good Muslim an average good Muslim and if a girl comes and tells that Muslim let's spend the night together he will say Zina, spending night together, haram. He will not agree. This is the Satan coming directly. But the same average Muslim, if a girl falls him, he will say, speaking to a Namaram girl on the phone, no problem. No problem, not speaking to a girl on the phone. Then after a few times speaking on the phone, when the girl says, let's go to have coffee in Starbucks. Ah, going with a girl to have coffee in the Starbucks, no problem. So he goes to have coffee with the girl in the Starbucks. Then the girl says, let's go and have dinner together. I'm going to have dinner with the girl, Namaram girl, no problem. Then she says, let's spend the night together. He says, no problem. This is khutwatu shaitan. It is my example, it's not mentioned in the Quran. Quran only says khutwatu shaitan. I'm giving you an example, what is khutwatu shaitan? This is how you keep on breaking the barrier of hijab and slowly, slowly the Satan gets the better of you. So Allah says in the Quran, Ya you ladina amanu, O you believe, utkhlofi silmi ka'affa, enter into Islam wholeheartedly, and follow not the footsteps of the devil. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, in the book of faith, hadith number 79, that the Prophet said, whenever you see anything wrong, the best, is if you can stop it with your hand, you stop it with your hand. If you cannot stop it with your hand, then stop it with the tongue. If you cannot stop it with the tongue, the least you can do is curse in your heart. And then you will be the lowest level of mu'min, the lowest level of believer. When you see something wrong in the duty of the Muslim, if he can, you should stop it with the hand, number one. If he cannot, stop with the tongue. Ask him to stop that activity. If he cannot, the least he can do is curse in his heart, then he is the lowest level of believer, the lowest level of moment. According to the Quran, Dawah, conveying the message of Islam to non-Muslim, is a farther every Muslim. Allah says in Surah Al-Asr, 
chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, wal asr, by the token of time. Inna insana lafi khusr, man is verily in a state of loss. Wal asr, inna insana lafi khusr, illa lazina amunu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haq, wa tawasaw bil sab. Except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, and those who exhort people to the truth and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four things are required according to Surah Al Asar. Iman, that is faith, Amal Salihat, that is righteous deeds. Watawasaw bil haq, inviting people to truth, and Watawasaw bil sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. And Imam Shafi, Rahimullah, he said that if this Surah Asar was revealed, it would have been sufficient for guidance for humankind. Imam Shafi Rahimullah, he said that if this surah was only revealed, this one surah of three verses would have been sufficient for guidance for humankind. It is so powerful. So if you want to go to Jannah, it is first you should do all four things. You may be a very good Muslim. You may be praying five times a day. You may have gone for Hajj. You may be fasting in the month of Ramadan. You may be paying Zakat. But if you don't do Dawah, if you don't convey the message to the non-Muslims, according to Surah Al-Asad, you shall not go to Jannah. Only Dawah is also not sufficient. All four are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, Dawah, Watawa, Sabil Haq, and inviting people to truth and inviting people to patience and perseverance. If you don't do dawah according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not go to Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and then put you in Jannah, if you don't do dawah, that's Allah's prerogative. Because Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4, 116, if Allah pleases, He may forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, He'll never forgive. The biggest sin in Islam for any human being is the sin of shirk associating partners with Allah. It is a duty that we tell to the other non-Muslim brothers and sisters that you worship only one true God. And Allah shows you a way in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, in how to do dawah, how to convey the message of Islam, how to do jihad, strive and struggle with the non-Muslims with the Quran. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64, Kul ya hal al-kitab, say O people of the book, Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa in bayna baynakum, come to common terms as us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illa Allah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bhi shayyon. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yatta khizabad, dunabad, dan arbaban minun illa. That we erect not among ourselves. Lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakul shadu. Say be witness. Be anna muslimoon. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah. This verse of the Quran shows you a way how to do dawah. Come to common terms as between us and you. Come to commonalities and you can use the same strategy to counter the media when they say Muslims are terrorists, Islam is a religion of terrorism. I'd like to give you an example. After 9-11, in the year 2003, when I went to USA, I landed in Los Angeles. And being a guy, I am prepared that they'll be questioning. When I landed in the Los Angeles airport in 2003, I knew I'm a soft target. Cap, beard, coat, tie, looking like a joker. I'm a soft target, I know that. This helps me to Rudawa. Moment they see me, okay. Go for questioning. So the immigration officer asked me, that why have you come here? I said, to receive an award. He asked me, which award? What do you do? I said, I spread truth. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, speak the truth and truth shall see you. So my job is to speak the truth and spread the truth. I'm a die. So he asked me, that are you a Wahhabi? <laughs> so I told him, you know, Wahhab, is the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. I'm Abdul Wahab. I am a servant of Allah. No, no, what are you? Are you Shia Sunni? I told there's no Shia Sunni in the Quran. I'm a Muslim. 
I told him, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 159, anyone who makes sex in the name of Islam, oh Prophet, have nothing to do with them. Islam does not encourage making sex. All these great ayamas, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, they were great scholars. They came to give us guidance, not to divide the Muslims, to get them together. <laughs> then I was sent to the customs and I'm prepared. When they opened my bag, they found a DVD of mine, Terrorism and Jihad. You know, and on the DVD cover, there was a gun, a photograph of a gun. So the custom office asked me, that, do you believe in jihad? I said, yes. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, believed in jihad. He said, you should strive and struggle. Even I believe in jihad, I strive and struggle. He said, no, 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 no. What I mean, that do you believe in killing? I said, that Jesus Christ said, take the sword and fight in Gospel of Luke. The Bible talks about killing in the book of Exodus. Chapter number 22, verse number 18 to 20 that we should kill. The killing and fighting is also prescribed in the Bible in the book of Exodus. Chapter number 32, verse number 27 28. It's also mentioned in the book of Numbers. Chapter number 31, verse number 1 to 18. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 19, verse number 27. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, chapter number 22, verse number 36, take in the sword and fight. The customer office asked me, sir, sir, can we ask you one more question? So I just phoned my host who was waiting outside, that don't worry, I'm just doing dawa here. <laughs> I quote their scriptures to make them understand Islam. I have done this many times, but unfortunately in the past couple of years, because of my popularity, now moment I enter, they know my name, Zakir Naik. Die. My name is already in the computer now, in advance. So nowadays I don't have that chance of doing dawa. No, no, because of Peace TV. And today the Western world, because I explain Islam so well, they don't like it. If we continue, then most of the people will end up liking Islam. So that's the reason they try the level best to see to it that I'm not able to convey my message. And it's very easy to do dawa, very easy. In India, I've got no problem with the Hindus. I tell them that if you read Mahabharat, Mahabharat is one of the sacred scriptures of the Hindus. If you read Mahabharat, there are more verses of fighting in Mahabharat than in the Quran. Multiple times more verses of fighting in the Mahabharat than the Quran. But the Hindu tells me, no, but you know that fighting is truth against falsehood. So I said, same fighting is in the Quran, truth against falsehood. Oh, then we have no problem with the Quran. So easy. If you read Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita is the most widely read book among all the Hindu scriptures. It is a guidance given by Sri Krishna, who is considered as God by the Hindus, to Arjun in the battlefield. If you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 1, Verse number 45, 46, 47. Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 1, verse number 45. says, Arjun, he keeps all his weapons on the ground in the battlefield. In the battlefield, he keeps his weapons on the ground and says, I would prefer dying unarmed rather than fight my cousins. If you know Mahabharata, it's a story about cousins fighting among themselves. The Pandavas were five and Kauravas were hundred. They're fighting among themselves. So Arjun says, I would prefer dying unarmed in the battlefield than fight my cousins. A few verses later, Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2, verse number 2 and 3, Sri Krishna Almighty God of the Hindus, he gives his advice. Oh Arjun, how could you be so impotent? How could you be so scared? It is the duty of the Kshatriya to fight. Who's saying that? Sri Krishna is telling Arjun that it is the duty of the Kshatriya to fight. Now, if I tell that Sri Krishna is telling Arjun to kill his cousins, it will be devilish. It's quoting out of context. What Sri Krishna is saying that for the truth, even if you have to fight your cousin, no problem. 
be close to truth as Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 135 Ya amanu, O you believe stand out for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it be against yourself against your parents against the relatives whether they be rich or poor but if I quote out of context it will sound devilish and many of the critics of Islam they quote the famous hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which I quoted earlier that our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, book of Jihad, hadith number 46, that if a mujahid is killed in the battlefield, he will go to paradise. Otherwise, Allah will bring him home safely with rewards and war booty. If you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 37, Sri Krishna is telling Arjun, O oh Arjun, blessed are those people who get opportunity to fight. And if you die in the battlefield, you will go to Swarg, to paradise. Or if you come back safely, Allah will give you the booty of war. Verbatim what is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume 4, hadith number 46, is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 37. When critics like Arun Shuri take out mistake in the Quran, they have not read their own Hindu scriptures. So easy. I never have problem while speaking to the Hindus. Majority of the Hindus, when they hear my speech, they like only there may be some politicians. Politicians like creating fitna and discord. So the politicians may not like my speech because you know Zakir is uniting the Hindus and Muslims together. So they create that fitna. You know, for the vote bank. Otherwise, normally with the common Hindus, I've got no problem. I quote the scriptures for them to understand Islam better. And many of the critics of Islam, they quote the famous verse of the Quran of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, which says, wherever you find a kafir, you kill him. And Arun Shuri in his book, The World of Fatwas, quotes the same verse. And he gives the reference. Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, wherever you find the kafir, into bracket, he says Hindu, you kill him. And when you open the Quran, Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, when you read the translation, the Quran does say, wherever you find the unbeliever, kafir, kill him. But it is out of context. To understand the context, you start from verse number 1 of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9. There was a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. This peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, He is giving an ultimatum to the mushriks of Makkah. Put things straight in four months time, otherwise the declaration of war. And in the battlefield, when the enemy come, when they come to kill you, when they come to attack you, in the battlefield, when the unbelievers come, then kill them. Don't get scared, kill them. And wait for them in every stratagem of war. This is a verse of the Quran talking about the battlefield. When the enemies break the contract and when they come in the battlefield to fight you, don't get scared, fight them back. And this is normal, any army general, to boost the morale of his soldiers, he will not say run away. He will say when the enemies come, you fight them. That is what the Quran says. It is a verse in the battlefield. It's taken out of context. And Arun Shuri, after quoting verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7. You know why? Verse number 6 has the answer to his sickness. Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 6 says, If the unbelievers, if the enemies, if the kafir, if they want peace, if they want asylum, don't just give it to them, escort them to a place of security. If the enemy, if the unbelievers, if they want asylum, if they want peace, don't just give it to them, escort them to a place of security so that they may hear the word of Allah. Today, which army general will say this? Maximum will tell his soldiers, if the enemy want peace, let them go. Here Quran said, don't let them go. Escort them to a place of security. And almost all the verses of the Quran, whenever it talks about fighting in the battlefield, the next verse says, peace is better. Whichever verse you pick up of the Quran. 
when he talks about fighting in the battlefield against the enemy, immediately next verse says, peace is better. Even this verse says, if the enemy want peace, give it to them. And the Quran is very explicit. The verse which was cited by the Qari in the beginning of the program, Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 32 says that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. Here the Quran says, if any human being kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, any human being kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for corruption, for spreading corruption, or for murder, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. This verse of the Quran alone is sufficient to prove that Islam is against killing of any innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. There is no other scripture in the world which says this, that if you kill one human being, you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save one human being, you have saved the whole of humanity. Islam is so clear and explicit. Killing of any innocent human being is totally prohibited. And I remember in Bombay in 2006, I gave a talk on is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? That's a different subject altogether. And that happened immediately after the train bomb blast in Bombay. And the situation in Bombay was tense. Here the police is telling me that why don't you give a talk to explain to the Muslims? And the Muslims are telling me, why don't you give a talk to the police to explain? You know, so I'm on the edge of a sword now. In a sensitive situation, I gave a talk on the Muslim monopoly. And I gave my views. And during question and answer time, there was a Hindu who came and told that if I was a Muslim, you know, thousands of Muslims were killed in Gujarat, thousands of Muslim women were raped. And later on, there was a bomb blast that takes place in Bombay. More than 180 people are killed. And it was in the newspaper that Muslims are behind the bomb blast. So during question answer time, this Hindu gets up and says that if I was in the place of the Muslim, and if thousands of Muslims were killed, and thousands of women were raped, I would have done the same thing. I would have done the bomb blast in Bombay. And everyone clapped. I told him that what you're behaving is like a normal human being. It's a reaction. Thousands of Muslims are killed, and if thousands of Muslim women are raped, but I cannot do that. I, being a Muslim, I cannot do that because my Quran, the last and final commandment in the Quran, does not permit me to kill any innocent human being. If some Hindus have done in Gujarat, it does not permit me to kill the other Hindus in Bombay. It is private in Islam. Just because some Hindus did some mistake in Gujarat, I cannot harm the Hindus of Bombay. If you catch the Hindu in Gujarat who has done the mistake, give him to the law, give him punishment, I'm for it. But you cannot take revenge by killing Hindus in Bombay. It's not allowed in Islam. Imagine the innocent Hindu who's been harmed, his family forever would become enemies of Islam. Killing any innocent human being is prohibited in Islam. And one more example that when I was in UK, or when I was allowed to go to UK, I gave a talk on the same topic, Islamic viewpoint on terrorism and jihad. A young boy after my lecture said, Nare Takbir, Allah Akbar. And then he said, Death to George Bush. Death to George Bush. I give such a good lecture. Now, this young Muslim, on my full lecture, you know, Hindi me bolte pani pher diya. Means he has ruined my full lecture. Everyone is clapping and he gets up. Death to George Bush. And everyone clapped. Then I told him that if you read the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prayed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that there were two staunch enemies of Islam. Both their names were Umar. So a prophet prayed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that at least give hidayah to one Umar. 
and Allah gave his dad Umar bin Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. Who became the staunchest supporter of Islam. So I pray to Allah that give Hidayat to George Bush. <laughs> By killing him, we won't solve the problem. I pray that give Hidayat to one of the two, George Bush or Tony Blair. You read the seerah of the Prophet rather than be emotional. You know, Muslim, we are emotional. If you read the seerah of the Prophet, you know how did the Prophet deal with things. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 190, that fight against those who fight you, but do not transgress, for Allah likes not those who are transgressors. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 193, that fight until there is no more tumult and oppression. Islam is against oppression. And even when we do kital, there are certain guidelines laid down by Allah and His Messenger for Qital that when you have to fight in self-defense, almost all were in self-defense. There are guidelines laid down that when you fight, do not chop trees, do not hurt the women, do not hurt the old men, do not come in the battlefield, do not kill children, do not break down monasteries, do not destroy the temples. Today you find in the all bombing everyone, women kill, children kill, men kill. If you compare in the complete history of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were 82 encounters taking place and 1,018 people were killed. In World War I, more than 10 million people were killed. In World War II, more than 20 million people were killed. Compare this. Today, as I said, media is very powerful, can convert black into white, day into night. When the Christian nuns when they cover the head, they are respected. When Muslim women cover the head, then they say Islam degrades the woman. Why? When the Sikh wears a turban and keeps a beard, he is called religious. When Muslim wears a cap and keeps a beard, he is called as a fundamentalist terrorist. <laughs> Why these double standards? I would like to end my talk by replying to the allegation of the media that Islam was spread by the sword. And it's a common allegation laid down by the international media that Islam was spread by the sword. The reply to this allegation is given very well by a famous historian by the name of Delacy O'Leary. He mentions in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number eight, Delacy O'Leary says, history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. I would like to repeat the statement of Delisio O'Leary, the famous historian. History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most absurd, fantastic myth that historians have repeated. When we read history, we come to know that we Muslims, the Arabs, they ruled the Arab lands for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came, for a few years, the French came, but as a whole, the Muslim Arabs were the lords of the Arab lands. Yet today, there are more than 9 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means they are Christians in generation. These 9 million Arab Christians are giving shahada, are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for about a thousand years. That time India was the most powerful country in the world. The Mughals, the Muslims. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim to accept Islam at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. Today, in India, more than 80% of the Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. <laughs> Today, the largest populated Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. I'm asking the question, which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army came to Malaysia, which has more than 55% Muslims? Which Muslim army? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? Thomas Carlyle writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship. 
he places our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his number one hero prophet. Number one. And he writes that every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's mind, it dwells. One man in the full world. It will do little good if he takes up a sword and propagates it. You have to first get your sword, the sword of intellect. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Thomas Carlyle is talking about the sword of intellect. Today, Islam is conquering the hearts not with the sword of steel, but with the sword of intellect, with the sword of peace. There was a survey done which was given in the Reader Digest Almanic book in the 1984 as well as Prince with Magazine. And this survey gave the increase in the major world religions in a span of 50 years. From 1934 to 1984, in a span of 50 years, the increase in the major world religion. And number one religion that increased maximum was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I am asking the question, which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which converted millions of non-Muslims to Islam? Which war? Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. The fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. However much they try to suppress Islam, that much it grows. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 54, Makar Allah, wallahu khairul makreen. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. You know, after 9-11, the media is saying, Islam is the religion of terrorism, Muslims are terrorists. After 9-11, in a span of nine months, in America alone, 34,000 Americans accepted Islam. According to Johan Redley, in Europe alone, in a span of 10 months, more than 20,000 Europeans accepted Islam. Today, the media says, Islam subjugates the women. Islam does not give women their due rights. Do you know, out of the people accepting Islam, two-thirds of the people are women. I'm asking who is forcing the American women to accept Islam? Who is forcing the European women to accept Islam? Allah promises in the Quran in no less than three different places. Allah promises in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, and Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. That Allah has sent His messenger with the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Socialism, Atheism, Modernism, Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulli, master them all. Farukayya mushikun. How am I the mushrik going like it? And the ending of the other verse is different. Allah says, Huwa allazi arsara rasoolah biluda wa dine haq liyu zira wa dine kulli wa kafa billahi shayda. Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other isms, over all the other religions, whether it be Judaism, Christianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Socialism, Modernism. Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulli. Master them all. And enough is Allah as a witness. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said that people worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Wa akhirat dawan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.